Hi, I'm Shabang. I'm a member of the Bell Live team. Is everyone ready to dive into our aquatic adventure? Come with us as our scientists take us on a live electronic field trip. Today, we'll learn about fresh water in a cold water stream. We'll even discover what lives under the water. Strange and cool insects that are really important to the health of a stream. We'll look at trout up close, brook, brown, and rainbow. They all naturally live in this area. And we're even going to fly fish. Watch as we bring a trout stream back to life and start to understand how fresh water and people can get along. So as you can tell, we got a whole lot of stuff to do, but first we want to tell you where we are, and we have a little map that's going to help us out with that. First of all, we are definitely in the Western Hemisphere, I know that. I think we're in North America. Yep, I got that down. Specifically, we are in East Central Minnesota, right near the Wisconsin border there. And the stream that we are next to is a first order tributary to the St. Croix River, which in turn is a tributary to the mighty Mississippi. It is a high alkalinity, spring-fed stream that really doesn't vary a lot in temperature. In fact, uh, in the wintertime, it very rarely gets uh, below about 4 degrees centigrade. In the summertime, it very rarely gets above 15 degrees centigrade. So very little variation in temperature. Okay, you know where we are. Now we have to figure out how we get to you. And the person who's going to help us with that is Casey Peterson. Casey. Hi, I'm Casey Peterson from Western Minnesota. I'm going to show you about some of the technology used to make Bell Life happen. Behind me is the satellite uplink truck. It uplinks all the information from the cameras and the monitors up to a satellite in space and downlinks it to a satellite by your school or cable company. Right here is the production truck. It's practically the brain of the whole operation. It has the monitors and everything. It's really wonderful. Let's go in and check it out. Here we are inside the production truck with our big wall of screens. On every screen, they show what each camera is showing. Right here is our director. He tells the cameras where to go on the screen and who to be on. Right here is our producer. She tells people what to say and how to say it. She also controls the time. And so back to you, Joan. She is so bossy, but we like her. <laughs> you know what, uh, Vanita's already over in an area where the stream splits into two different forks. We've got the uh, North Branch and we have the South Branch, Branch, and she is over there with the Bell Live team and they are busy sampling and testing, doing water quality studies, similar to probably what you have already done in class. Did you know that the water in these streams travel to the Mississippi River and then down to the Gulf of Mexico? Wow, did you know that? I know one person who does know that, Dr. Jim Almendinger. He's with the Science Museum of Minnesota. He's also a Bell Live water quality specialist. Now, Jim has been studying this stream for the past year. Jim, can you tell us what the water quality is like in, in this stream and how important that is? This is a really high uh, water quality stream. Uh, it's very healthy. You know, if you go to the doctor and get a checkup, the very first thing they would do would probably take your pulse and, and collect a sample of blood for chemical analysis. Uh, that's what we're doing out here. We're checking the pulse of the stream, its flow rate, and we're going to take uh, water samples and take, check its uh, chemical quality to also see what's happening in the watershed. Water really is the circulatory fluid of the ecosystem. It washes soil particles and nutrients through the watershed, and they all end up right here. If you want to protect the stream, you've got to protect the watershed. Have to do that. Now, you've got a map to show right. us of this stream. Why don't we take a closer look at that? Okay. Uh, it has two main branches here. The north branch is fed out of this lake up here, and the south branch down here is fed by springs. And that gives a little bit of different water quality through the two different segments. We're standing right now near the confluence where the two segments come together, and we're having students on both the south branch and the north branch take uh, some water samples for us and give us some numbers. Okay, once so. again, that is the north branch. Over here is the south branch, and uh, Micah, want to tell us what it's like in the water? How are you able to stand in that? Uh, I'm able to stand in here because well, it's only about 10 degrees Celsius. It's fairly cold, but um, I do not feel any of the water because I have waders on, and the waders protect me from getting wet as well as insulating me. Okay. Dr. Almendinger, tell us what some of the tests that they're doing, because I know some of the students have been doing their own tests back in their classrooms. What right. are these? They're doing not only temperature, but also dissolved oxygen and pH. Molly has a, a vial she filled up with water, and I'm going to check the dissolved oxygen content here. 
It's about 10 to 12 ppm. Right, which is parts per million. Okay. And Hans has pH. Explain the dissolved oxygen. Okay. What is that exactly? That's the, that's the amount of, of oxygen which comes from the atmosphere and also from plants that's in the water, and that's useful for aquatic organisms. They need that in order to breathe underwater. Okay, Hans, go ahead. Um, I've tested the pH levels in the, in the stream, and I found it at about 7.5. Okay, what is the significance of that 7.5? And tell me what the pH is. Well, that's, the pH is a measure of acidity, and that uh, 7.5 is right about in the middle of the range. Uh, it's kept at that range because of the dissolved minerals that are in the water, okay. the limestone that's in the area. So all of these readings and these measurements are kind of building up to a very healthy stream is what yeah, you're seeing. Yeah, it's, it's keeping things very clean for the okay. organisms that live here. Keep up those testing. Uh, strips here. Let's go over to the other side, to the north branch. What have we got going, Casey? Well, I'm testing for nitrate or nitrogen in the water, and it said it's about 0.5 parts per million. Parts per million. Okay. Right. Okay. Once again, explain that. Okay, we're looking at dissolved components here, especially nutrients and for dissolved minerals. Nitrate's an important nutrient. Phosphate is too. We'll measure for that later. Aaron has uh, the alkalinity measure, and that's yeah. a measure of dissolved minerals. Yes, I have alkalinity, and according to my reading, it says it's about 180 parts per million on here. So. Aaron and uh, Casey, what's it like doing this testing? Is it pretty easy to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Just you take the, the piece of paper, you put it in the water, and you wait for count, it to change color. Yeah, you count for a certain amount of time and wait for it to change color, and then look on the bottle and compare it. Does it take very long for it to change color? 30 seconds. Mine, 30 seconds. Yeah. Why is this testing so important? Well, because this really measures what's going on in the watershed. Nutrients could be washed off the land surface from either fields or lawns, uh, and that can perhaps overburden the aquatic ecosystem with too many nutrients and cause too much algal growth. These are very low numbers here, and that's a, that's a good sign. That is so great to hear. Now, we are going to come back, and we're going to compare the readings from both of the branches of the stream, and then we are going to compare the different readings, and then we're going to find out which one the trout actually prefer. Now, this might be a good time for you to actually get out your recording sheets as you do that. Remember earlier in the show, I was by those aquatic insects? Well, we're going to head on over to Joan, and she's going to get a closer look at the aquatic insects inside the stream. <laughs> Did you know that insects are necessary to keep the stream clean? I did know that, but the people who really know all about that are, are we have not only entomologists, but aquatic entomologists. We have Dean Hansen and Margaret Munson here with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about how bugs really are more than just fish food, aren't they? they got a lot more to do than that. Yes, they do, John. Well, we've already got the kids in the stream. What are, what are they doing for we've us down Rebecca there? We've got Rebecca and Amanda down with a seine net, and they're disturbing the bottom of the stream to dislodge insects that are living there in hopes of catching them on the stream, on the screen, and they're going to bring them up on the shore and take a look at them. Okay. And Curtis is using a dip net along the shore, uh, getting underneath the the uh, bank where the, the vegetation overhangs the bank and he's getting some of the insects that like to hang out there literally. Okay and uh, we've already got a few samples down along there and uh, we are trying to separate these out into four basic functioning groups kind of by how they feed. That's right. Right? Um, yes. Can you help me out with the four? I haven't written down but I know you guys know them by heart. Grazers, filtering collectors, Predators and shredders. Oh, good, they got them right. <laughs> so let's explain them and show them and see how they work. Okay, good, thanks. Well, Rebecca and uh, uh, Shabang, I guess, brought up a rock. And this is very typical of a, of a stream like this. Where it's, it's dominated by about three different types of caddisflies. Now, <laughs> caddisflies are animals. They're insect larvae, but they very typically make a house out of some kind of material. Here, uh, Joan, you have a caddisfly that's mm -hmm. put together a, a house out of little pieces of plant material. You would just think that would be just a little piece of debris. Yeah, you, of that's right. We really, do, we really do. What we have on this rock, a good examples of what's called a, a saddle case. Uh, a caddisfly larva, all you really see are just sort of looks like a mass of a, a dozen stone, stones in, in yeah. the shape of a dome or, or maybe something that looks like a tortoise shell. But these are cemented together with silk that the caddisfly larva spins out of its mouth, glues those things together. It's sort of a protective, you know, covering over yeah. them. And silk these, similar to a butterfly silk that you make. Well, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right, that, that a larva would make, right. And uh, what they do then is they slowly move across the rock inside their house and they eat, they're, they're literally grazing the algae that are growing on the rock. So these are what we call grazers or, sh or um, well, grazers, they're, 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 they're chewing up the algae that are growing on the mm -hmm. rock. 
Another kind of caddis fly is what we have right here. Here again, they're, they're making a house, but this is sort of, sort of out of silk and very fine sand grains. He anchors himself in the, on the rock, anchors his front end of his case on the rock, and then, Joan, he sits with his, with his legs out in the water current like that, and they, they gather or they collect any fine particles of food uh, that come to him. Little and he's pieces. just clinging for dear life, and the water is rushing past him, and he's filtering. Well, he's clinging. Actually, he's anchored the front of his case onto the rock, so he's got six legs. Two of them are feeding food into his uh -huh. mouth, and the, the other four are, 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 are collecting any little pieces of crud that uh, come out. Hiding back in here, maybe some other kinds of, of a, sort of a filtering a caddis fly. They make a little net very, very much like a, a spider web, but the, as the water current is moving, it's bringing fine pieces of food to that uh, caddis fly. They caught the net, and then the caddis fly comes out and actually just chews down the net. So you multiply, you know, a half a dozen caddis flies like this on one rock by the number of rocks in the stream. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and you get a lot of a lot of uh, filtering. They're Mark, creative little things, aren't they? They are. Right. <laughs> now you've got the the more dangerous sounding ones, the predators well, and the shredders we have over predators here. Predators right? and shredders here. But to continue a moment with what Dean was talking about, we have some of the case building caddis flies here that shred that help take a leaf for example as it falls off the tree initially looks like that mm -hmm. and they work on it until in the end it's basically a skeleton of itself mm -hmm. another one that does the very same thing is called a stonefly and this is a stonefly nymph not cooperating with you not today. cooperating <laughs> and this is a different kind of an insect altogether than a caddis fly it develops <coughs> in the water, develops wing pads, excuse me, <coughs> and then as an adult, mm -hmm. takes a wing and is a winged insect as an adult. Mm -hmm. They have gills that they need to, for breathing under the water. Can you see the little fluffy, fine, white structures? Those are gills. Oh. We also have the predators, and one of the predators we have in here is... Why do you call them predators? They're predators because they feed on live animal material. Got to be live. Only okay. live animal material. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a predator. This is a giant water bug. And the predators that are bugs, the true bugs, that is, mm -hmm. the water bugs, have a piercing and sucking mouth part. So they don't chew up their food like some of the others, but mm -hmm. they actually stick in this needle-like mouth part and suck out the insides of their prey. Another predator. Has yeah. anyone ever seen one this big? <laughs> this one's a big this one. This one doesn't like me. See how it's grabbing a hold here and trying to defend itself? Is that what it's doing? See how it's pinching my fingers and holding on? Does that? It does hurt a little bit, but they actually, um, it doesn't hurt seriously. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> These are such voracious eaters oh my goodness. that they can feed on not only other insects that as large as themselves, but fish, perhaps. Oh my or frogs. goodness, small they, fish, I would Small assume, fish, huh? right. So they are another type of voracious predator. Now, what have I left out here? Well, you know students? what? I'm not certain, but there's somebody. We want to encourage everybody to just call in, email, fax with questions. We do have uh, a question from Jennifer in New York. Jennifer, what's your question? Um, do insects live better in fast-moving water or in still water? Do they what better in fast-moving water or still water? Do insects live better live in fast-moving water or in slow water? Good question. Some insects need the faster flowing water to live better, and some can do just fine in very standing still water, like a pond or a marsh. And some insects have the ability to deal with the differences. They can live in both places. Uh -huh. The stoneflies, for example, are almost always in the fast flowing water. Okay. The caddisflies are insects that can live in both places and they have adapt, uh, adaptations they've evolved over years to deal with the fact that there's a lot of differences primarily in dissolved oxygen. Very good question. Yeah, very good question. You know what, How we're about, seeing them out of their element here. Let's put them into something closer do we to their have, element. Do we have there. time to include the kids um, with their questions that they had? Do you have or? a question? Yeah. yeah. Let's hear it. There's this one, it looks like it's a leaf, but it keeps moving. What is this? Ah, let's see. Which one are we talking about here? This, this one. Oh my gone. gosh, good yeah. eyes. Doesn't this look like a, a stick or a piece of vegetation or a leaf? This is a water scorpion. Why do you suppose they call it a water scorpion? <laughs> Why is it called a water scorpion? Well, it's got this tail on the end that perhaps looks a little threatening, but they cannot sting you. No stinging. For it's me. a breathing tube. So this, this long... Uh, extremity actually pierces the surface of the water and remains in, remains in contact with air when they need air. It's like a straw. It's like a straw, so Got they it. breathe atmospheric oxygen. Any other quick questions well, yeah, no, here? What, what is this? 
That's another type of predator. Excellent, excellent. Look how well camouflaged that would be at the base of a stream. It's flat, it gets down in the substrate, and you can't see it, but it's a dragonfly. And dragonflies are voracious eaters. They not only eat as larvae, but they eat as adults. Wow. You know what? We haven't got much time, but we okay. do want to hit the, uh, the stream up here to see what they're like in something that's closer to their environment. Right, Dean? Okay, yeah. John, what we're seeing here, I'm going to put the end of a pencil down. I have a rock here, and you can see this sort of long tapered case, maybe looks like a, uh, uh, a, a chimney perhaps. It's a caddisfly and he's not being very cooperative right now. He's buried himself in this case, but normally they sit, they have their legs sticking out from the front of this case here and they're, they're basically getting the food that's being carried right to them. Uh, remember a stream is very, very different from a pond or a lake. In a stream, all an insect has to do is stay in one spot and he's getting this constant bit of food moved toward him. Uh, here's another, this, this little mass of rocks down here. This is this uh, a grazing type caddisfly case. And if I can quickly move this up and hopefully get it in focus, we have an example here. You see this, this uh, opening here. This is where the, uh, this is where the uh, oh, uh, water flows into a, uh, into a little uh, net-like device that this um, other type of caddisfly is making. He's filtering very, very, very fine particles out of the water. So, John, we have these grazers, the shredders, they're all working together basically to keep the stream nice and clean for people to enjoy, for fish yeah, to enjoy. we got to appreciate those bugs. You know, it's very interesting, but, uh, well, we have a question from Sarah in Colorado. Why don't we go to that before we talk about why we study flies and insects. Sarah? Um, uh, which insect is the trout's favorite? Ooh, which insect is the trout's favorite? Well, I would guess perhaps some of the caddisflies and the scuds would be some of the trout's favorite, but Dean actually does more uh, fishing than I do. Well, Martin, I, I guess <laughs> I would say to answer that question that, that the trout is very opportunistic, and like if a thousand mayflies are swimming on up to the water surface to emerge, the trout says, nah, I'm going to forget scuds, here are the mayflies. Ah. Uh, vice versa, if the mayflies are quiet and the scuds just after dark start to drift in the water current, that is, they let go of the substrate that they're on and they drift, then the trout to will change their habits. So uh, it, it all depends. Uh, whatever's easiest to catch with the least expenditure of energy, that's what a trout, that to that moment is the trout's favorite insect. All right. Well, now we know what the fish eat. Let's find out what kind of fish we have in that stream. Did you know that there are 26,000 species of fish worldwide? We've got a lot of exciting things going on here. You are about to see a research technique called electrofishing. They'll actually be shocking the stream behind me. And what happens is they stun the fish, it comes up to the surface, and then researchers can easily net the fish to test them. Now I have here with me Andrew Simons. He's a Bell Live ichthyologist. Who knows what ichthyology is? Can you guess? It's someone who studies or researches fish. Now, in the stream itself, we've got a bunch of students and we have Jerry Grant, who is a Bell Live trout specialist. And they're going to be shocking the stream. You can hear the generator on that boat. Now, tell us, Andrew, about what he is doing right now. Why would you want to shock a stream? Well, uh, electrofishing is an excellent way to uh, capture fish for research projects effectively and quickly. and. Uh, you would want to shock a stream to uh, get some idea of how many fish there are in the stream at any one time, or if we're involved in some kind of study where we're looking at growth rates, or if we're interested in what kind of food the fish are eating, which is something that we're going to be doing later on today. Does it hurt the fish though? It sounds like it's dangerous. No, it doesn't hurt the fish. Uh, the fish are stunned very quickly, and, uh, and then they're scooped into buckets and they recover very quickly afterwards, so it doesn't appear to hurt them You can at all. see the students doing that right now. Can you give us a play-by-play -play of how this electrofishing works, the shocking of the stream? Sure. The, uh, as you can see, there's a uh, generator inside that little boat, and uh, that generator is attached to two electrodes. One electrode is on the bottom of the boat, and the other electrode is actually on the end of that yellow wand that Jerry's holding. So when the thing is powered up, there's electric current flowing between the two electrodes. Okay, when you say electric current in water, obviously kids are studying science now, that's kind of dangerous. How dangerous is that for them to be in there with electric current and in the water like that? Well, it's actually very safe if you have a good crew that's trained. Um, 
as you notice, uh, everyone in the stream is wearing chest waders and they're also wearing uh, rubber gloves. So they're essentially completely insulated from the electri any electric current in the stream. Now, if you were to put your hand in there, a bare hand, uh, you would get a shock. Oh, wow. So you have to be careful. How powerful of a shock can it be? Uh, it, it could be pretty painful. Oh, okay. Okay, we've got a question from Caitlin in Denver. Go ahead, Caitlin. Welcome to Bell Live. Do okay. fish ever eat other fish? Do, can you repeat that for me? Do fish ever eat other fish? Do fish ever eat other fish, Andrew? Oh, yes, they do. And in fact, uh, some of the fishes that we have in this stream, the brown trout, are once they get quite large, they'll actually feed on some of the other trout. Okay. That's how they keep the system going. It's it part seems of that the way, yeah. How common is this technique? You're an ichthyologist. You study and research fish. How often do we see this happening where you shock a stream? Well, electrofishing is commonly used, especially in fisheries biology. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very effective way of catching fish quickly and safely. How crucial is it for you to use this technique? Well, I think that most people that, that study fish biology that work in the field do some shocking at some point. It all depends on the kind of stream that you're working in, though, and the kind of study that you're doing. Can you motion to us again what happens? You're actually shocking the stream. What happens? The fish actually come up to the surface? It's like they're popping up? Well, actually, it's really strange. The fish are attracted to the positive electrode in a process called galvanotaxis. I don't really understand how it works, okay. but uh, that's what happens. And then as they come close, the uh, fish are scooped up. It looks like someone nearly fell down in there. <laughs> All right, we've got a call from Minnesota. Go ahead. Welcome to Bell Live. Do you ever if it hurts the fish when they, when they shock them? Can you repeat that for me? Do you if it hurts the fish when they shock them? Well, you know, that's a really good question. A lot of students are going to want to know this. Does it hurt the fish when you shock the stream? I mean, it sounds so severe when you say shock the stream. Initially, they might feel a little bit of pain, but I don't think it's very much pain at all. Uh, they recover almost immediately as soon as they're put in the bag, bag, in the bucket, and they don't seem to show any ill effects. So I don't think it's painful, and I don't think it's a real problem for the fish. It just stuns them. They stop. It's, it stuns them pretty much right away. Okay. All right. Now, as uh, Jerry and the students finish up what they're doing, they're going to be bringing the fish up to the aquariums that we have set up over here. And a little bit later, you're going to be able to see what type of species of fish are in the stream. But right now, we want to head on over to Joan and Dr. Jim Almendinger. We're going to find out more about those two branches of the stream, and we'll get some of the results from that. You're right, we're back at the confluence and they have been busy dipping and sampling and uh, putting in that litmus paper and they've figured out all of the details that we need to know, right? Okay. So get ready with your, to record the data in your classrooms. Okay, how about here on the, on the south branch here, we have Micah and, and Molly to read the results. Um, the temperature on the south branch was 10 degrees Celsius, the pH balance was 7.5 and the dissolved oxygen was between 10 and 12 ppm. And uh, the phosphate was 0 ppm and um, the nitrate it was only 2 ppm and the alkalinity was 240 ppm. Okay, how about the, the north branch over here, Rebecca and Hans? Do the temperature uh, first. The temperature is 12 degrees Celsius and the, the pH? pH is 7.5 and the dissolved oxygen was between 8 and 12 ppm. The phosphate was pretty much undetectable. For nitrate, it was about 0.5 parts per million, and the alkalinity was about 180 parts per million. Okay, now what, what difference does really jump out to you kids? Well, the temperature. Right. Okay, a why, do you, degrees. why do you think that'd be different? We've got a spring-fed stream over here, and this branch over here on the north is lake-fed. Why would that be? Well, the spring temperatures are pretty much constant. They, the groundwater comes out of the ground at about 10 degrees, so that's why this branch stays close to that temperature most of the year round. On the north branch, because it comes out of the lake, the lake still has heat left over from the summertime. And that's still coming out of the stream. And that affects dissolved oxygen. Colder water holds more, so the south branch has higher dissolved oxygen content. And groundwater on this side, alkalinity was different too. You guys had 180 and we had 240 over here. There's more alkalinity on this side because it has more dissolved minerals in the water. Now, I know you've been hanging around by these streams for quite a while. Right. You were here in July, and you got different temperature readings, there much was, more significant difference. Yeah, there were at least 10 degrees difference between the, the north branch over here and the south branch over here, which is cooler. Okay. Well, so. these were really cool tests, but you know what? I know you have more sophisticated machinery that's been yeah. doing the testing for you. Can True. you talk about that? Sure. 
That's an electronic probe, is it yeah, not? It has uh, several probes on the tip of this one electronic sonde here, and it measures dissolved oxygen, conductivity, temperature, and pH. Conductivity is a measure of the dissolved mineral content as well. So uh, that, this is a much faster, more accurate way of doing it, and in fact, it's uh, a lot more expensive, but it's worth it. Okay. Now, I understand that we have a question from some of our viewers out there. Who do we have a question from? Matt Martinez. Okay. What, do you, what would you like to ask, Jim? Is there a lot of pollution in the river? Well, not in this stream per se. There, there's a little agriculture upstream, but it, it really is not affecting the stream in any harmful way. Uh, some nutrients might get into the stream, but it really is... I guess I have to say this is one of the cleanest streams in the entire metropolitan area here in East Central Minnesota. And a nice clean watershed we're dealing with right. here, huh? Now we're talking about monitoring devices. You have something even more sophisticated than what we looked at there with the electronic probe, right. and that's upstream? It's upstream, but we can't be in the field the whole time, so we have machines automatically collect samples for us, and that's what we have right here. Uh, as you see, I'm looking at a pipe now. That's actually a, a very shallow well driven about five feet into the ground. We're looking at the water under the stream as well as in the stream because that water gets into the stream. This device measures water level. You know, when the float and the pipe goes up and down, the little wheel turns and the level is recorded. And we store all these numbers back here in this metal box. We have a small computer in this box uh, that measures and records stream level, uh, conductivity, electrical conductance, and uh, water temperature. We also have an automatic sampler. That's what this barrel thing looks like. It's a pump on top of the sampler and there are tubes connected underground to the stream. The pump turns on at predetermined times to, to measure the, and sample the water. And they have 24 bottles in ice. We can fill, it, fill up each one in sequence. And we have to pull them out about once a week when we get there. And there's the sample right there. It's a, it's a liter sample, about a quart. Okay, what you're left with there is a lot of information. We need to do something with that information. Right, we, so take it, does it go? we take it back to the lab. But in fact, the field work is great fun. The lab work's great fun. But we also have a lot of computer work to do. That's what we do in the meantime during the winter months when things are too, too cold to work outside all the time. Uh, so we do both the, the field and the lab and the computer work. Now here's the, the lab work. Uh -huh. uh, my colleague Sean is going to filter the water samples. He's putting a clean filter on the, the funnel right there. Uh, we're, we're looking not only at dissolved components, but suspended materials as well. Suspended materials are things like soil, algae, and other bits of debris that fall into the stream. And they, they, they're the things that make the water look muddy. Uh, now this is actually a very clean stream, but by the time we filter the sample, we'll, you'll realize that it does contain a dissolved load, uh, and well, suspended load in this case. Sean is putting the samples under suction. The water's gone through, and now he has a fairly dirty filter here. Uh, even though this is a clean stream, it still can carry about 100 kilograms per day of suspended material. We'll take that filter and weigh it. And the heavier the filter, that means the dirtier the water. And does it vary a lot from uh, time to time? Not a lot in this stream except when there's a storm flow. And then more things wash off the land. Now we also measure dissolved components. Here Kelly is working on a machine to measure the dissolved organic carbon. That comes out of the vegetation in the watershed. And we use ultraviolet light to convert that organic carbon to carbon dioxide. Oh, that's interesting. I appreciate you spending the time with sure. us. I learned a great lot. Great fun. Yeah. And you know what? Speaking of great fun, the uh, Bell Museum has a website. You might want to check it out today because they've added a cool new game where you kind of get to make decisions about your environment and uh, end up finding out how those decisions impact your watershed. That's kind of a cool deal. Give that a shot. Um, you know what? Thank you so much for calling in and asking questions. We really do appreciate your involvement. So don't hesitate to email or fax or give us a call. And uh, Marcus from Colorado has already done that. Marcus, what's your question? Um, what, how fast does the water travel? Well, this water uh, is traveling about, on average, about a foot per second. I know mean, the middle part of the stream is going faster than that. But in fact, there's so much slow water along the edge, the average velocity of the stream from one edge to the other is about a foot per second. Is there anything you don't know about this stream? <laughs> well, I'm going to keep studying it for the next few years to make sure I don't. We'll get back things, to you. So. <laughs> now it's time to head it over to the uh, trout research scientists, see what they caught. Okay, we've been doing a lot of work since you last saw us. They actually brought the fish now into the safe aerated aquariums and they're kind of swimming around. You might have been concerned shocking the stream, the electro fishing, but the fish are actually moving it around and swimming. Some of them are a little bit more sedate than the others. Jerry is on shore along with uh, Andrew and we've got Aaron and Casey as well here to just take a closer look at these fish. Jerry, why don't you tell us what they are and describe them to us? Sure. Uh, 
This species on the far right is a rainbow trout, and uh, they're native to the western U.S., and they're named after that beautiful red lateral stripe on, on their side. Um, notice they have lots of black markings that extend up onto the dorsal fin and back onto the tail fin. Very appropriate name for that fish because yes. of that stripe. Yeah, they're very colorful. Okay. And what have we got here in this tank? In the center tank are some brown trout, and these are introduced from Europe. Um, very common in southeastern Minnesota. Notice they have both red and black marks surrounded by light halos. And uh, they don't have the spotting on their tail fin like the rainbow trout do. Okay. And then in this tank, Andrew, do you want to describe this one? Well, in this okay. tank we've got a uh, brook trout, and we've got a beautiful uh, specimen with breeding colors. And we'll try and move them up to, against the glass so you can see them. And these things have uh, a sort of white markings against a dark background and these vermiculations all along the dorsal surface. It's just beautiful. Oh the yeah, color. they're just gorgeous fish. And this is like the only na native trout in this uh, stream. Okay. Now tell us about, uh, uh, this is the basically what's made up in the stream. These fish are all in the stream here. Are there different types of species also? There's these three species of trout and then uh, the riffle sculpin which is in the far tank and riffle sculpin are small fishes. They usually inhabit riffle areas. Um, they eat insects whole. And you'll notice they have big pectoral fins. And they use those fins to, uh, to use the force of the water flowing by them to pin them down to the bottom of the stream. Oh, boy, he's really moving. Yeah, you can take him out and you can. Oh, gosh. And it's, it's a slimy sculpin. And very, it's slimy. It's very slimy. Slimy is a good word for it. Uh, they don't yeah. have uh, scales like the trout do. You just rub your finger along its side. What do you think, Aaron? What does it feel like? He feels really slimy. I mean, he, he feels Casey, like what, do you, what you think of a snake to feel like. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of describing it. All right. Kelly from Florida has a question for Andrew and Jerry. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, you guys were, it looked like you were shocking a lot of fish. How many fish were you hoping on shocking and why so many? Okay, uh, it looked like you were shocking a lot of fish. Uh, how many fish did you actually shock and why did you pick that number or how did you come up with that number? Well, we just tried to collect some representatives of, of each species out of this pool. Um, when we, uh, if we were to count the fish in this pool, we would probably go uh, electric fish pool several times and remove uh, fish at each pass and uh, we can actually uh, estimate the number of fish in the pool using that method. Okay, now here's a fun part of Bell Live. I want the students to get involved with this in your classroom, okay? Andrew is going to talk about the eyes of the fish. Now, you can see that the eyes are very on either side of the fish, and you kind of wonder how are they able to see? What can they see? And you can see it's on either side of the fish there. It's not like what we have on front of our face. Andrew? Uh, why don't you use Casey and Aaron as your demonstrators here, and we'll get everyone in their classrooms to do the same. Talk about the vision of these fish. Okay, we'll do that. Um, first thing, everyone should should know that uh, trout are uh, visual predators, and so they rely heavily upon their eyesight to catch their prey. And uh, they can see a much have a much wider field of vision than uh, we do, and it's really hard for us to get a feeling of, of how big this uh, field of vision actually is. But one thing that we can do that will give us an idea is to look around. I want you guys to look over your right shoulder. Okay, look everyone back do this in your classroom. As too. far as you can. Okay, now remember, look at everything you're seeing. Think about all that stuff. Now look all the way across, look in front, and then look over the other shoulder. Okay, now remember everything you're seeing there. Now straighten out, now look up and rotate your head around. Look up this way, and then look up that way. That's how much a trout is seeing all the time. So it's a really wild field of view. And so they can see oh. predators from <laughs> any direction. Can you believe that? <laughs> I hope you all did that in your classrooms too. You get kind of an idea of what the trout are seeing. Now, Jerry, to understand the diet of these fish and the weight and everything, we actually have to anesthetize these fish. Right, and uh, I'll show you how we do that. I'll take a fish out of this tank, of one of the brown trout, and I'm gonna put it in a, a bucket of anesthetic. Um, this water has a chemical in it which will relax the muscles of the fish and it'll take a minute or two, um, but that fish will slowly completely relax and eventually it'll probably roll over in the bucket and then at that point we know it's lost its equilibrium. Um, it, at that point it's anesthetized and we can start to handle the fish. 
Okay, now I know a lot of students are concerned about what we're doing to the fish here. Is this hurting the fish? No, the, the fish is uh, still conscious and breathing fine. It's just completely relaxed. And, and it's actually um, to protect the fish so uh, when we're handling it, it doesn't struggle and um, accidentally fall on the ground or something. Okay, um, Aaron and Casey, do you have any questions for Jerry as this anesthetizing goes on? Yeah, I had one. Um, I was wondering whether you have to have like a special permit or license to like do this kind of thing with the fish. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, to, in order to use an electrofisher, you need a collecting permit, uh, which we get here from the State Department of Natural Resources. And they give them to schools and universities and researchers um, in order to go out and collect wild fish so they can study them or take them back to the lab. Okay. You obviously have one. Right, okay. right I have one. <laughs> or you wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question from Jen from New York. Jen, thank you so much for calling in. Welcome to Bell Live. Go ahead with your question. Is there more organisms in flowing water or still water? Can you repeat that question for me? I apologize. Is there more organisms in flowing water or still water? Good question. Now, Andrew, are there more organisms in flowing water or still water? Well, generally with, with fishes, we see more diversity in uh, streams than we do in, in uh, lakes. Okay. Is that what you find as well? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to just compare still water to uh, running water because it depends a lot on the individual stream or, or body of water you're working on. Some uh, bodies of water, like, like this stream, has uh, just four species, but other streams may have uh, 20 species. The Mississippi River, for instance, has probably 56 or 60 species of, of fish in it. Okay, how is our fish doing that's being anesthetized? I, I think he's relaxed and ready to go. Okay. And uh, you can see he's not moving, but his gills are still, uh, opercular um, is still moving. So we know he's, he's alive and breathing. So first we'll put him on the measuring board and uh, I'll weigh his, or measure his total length which is the length from his tip of his snout to the tip of his tail. And you can see that's about 266 millimeters, or 26.6 centimeters long. And now we can take it and uh, weigh the fish. Why is it important to do this, Jerry? Why do you have to measure and weigh the fish like this? Uh, measuring and weighing the fish is one way we estimate how fast they grow. And uh, that can tell us how many fish we can grow in a stream, for instance, and give us a guideline for how many we can remove without hurting the population. Okay, how much does So this weigh is about 211 grams. Okay. Now, we are going to actually find out the diet of this fish, what's inside the fish, and what you're going to do is pump the fish. That's right. I'm going to um, actually flush its stomach out with some water, and I do this using a this apparatus I have in my hand, which is simply a, a pipette bulb attached to some aquarium tubing, Tigon tubing. And uh, I can insert this through the fish's mouth. Can you give us a shot? Show, show us the mouth. Maybe point towards the camera here so kids can see the uh, mouth. It's not a view that we often get to see. Now, is this going to hurt the fish? I know a lot of students worry about that. Um, no, actually the fish is completely relaxed and uh, I found that as soon as I return these fish to the stream they start feeding immediately. So it doesn't seem to uh, interrupt their feeding behavior and they don't have any long-term effects from it. And that's why you anesthetize the fish. That's right. So I'm going to slowly pump some water into its stomach and you can see items already coming out. Oh wow. Okay, um, some people might think this is gross, but this is science. Got to see what the fish is eating. Well, this fish has been eating a lot of uh, amphipods, or scuds, as they're commonly called. They're almost <laughs> like little tiny shrimp, and uh, they're one of the main diet items of fish in this stream. Do you keep pumping it, or do you sort of um, stop after a while, or do you know when you've pumped it all out? When you empty the stomach, you'll stop getting um, items when you're flushing it, so then you'll know that you've, you've pretty much emptied the stomach. Casey, what do you think of this? Uh, it's cool. <laughs> what about you, Aaron? 
Um, it's probably not my favorite thing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some students who are going to agree with you. It's pretty gross, but why do you have to do this? I mean, some people would say it's so gross. You know, why? Right. Do well, it's one of the easiest way for us to find out what the fish is eating. Um, and this way the fish remains alive and we can return it to the stream. Um, we can also look at diet items between species, for instance, between brook and brown trout, um, to get an idea of whether they're competing for food. Okay, we have a call from Texas for Jerry and Andrew. Go ahead, Texas, welcome to Bell Live. Oh, hi. Um, I'd like to know, do those trout only eat uh, meat or vegetables? All right, I totally apologize. I cannot hear you, so why don't you repeat that question for me? Do those trout only eat meat or vegetables? Oh, do the trout eat meat or vegetables? Uh, trout are carnivores, and they eat um, either insects or other fish for the most part. Uh, sometimes they do eat some algae, but it, the algae probably contains insects, so they're really after the insects and the algae if they, if they consume any algae. Okay, great job. We got to see the insides of a fish. How often do you get to see that? Now, we are going to get ready to put these fish back into the stream. As we start preparing to do that, let's head on over to Joan and two anglers and some students for some fly fishing. <laughs> Did you know that you can fly fish for all different types of fish, not just trout? We are having fun over here. We are learning new skills today. Actually, I shouldn't say we. It's pretty much me and the Bell Live team. I'm here with a couple of really expert fly fishers. We have Nancy Kerber on my right and Elizabeth Scheuer on my left. And uh, first of all, why don't you just explain to me why you call it fly fishing? It's called fly fishing, Joan, because we're using artificial insects that mimic the natural insects that the trout feed on. Oh, we're not talking fly like fly, we're talking fly like what we were looking at like over there the on the stream. Like the insects in the stream, that's Okay, right. so do you have to choose like a special kind of insect if you think the, you know, the trout might be interested in a certain kind on a certain day? Or? Usually when we're fishing, much like when they did the kicksane net uh -huh. to see what was on the bottom, um, we try to match the hatch or match the insects that are in the stream. In oh. fact, Dan has one. Okay. A natural insect that has been preserved for us. What is that? That is a mayfly. That's a mayfly. A burrowing mayfly. So then you look for something that looks like a mayfly. Yes. Me to take I'll let you hold that, oh. and I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna let Dan pick out of my fly box what he thinks. Okay, Dan. Might work best. Compare the two. What looks like a mayfly to you? That one looks like a mayfly. Very good. That's probably the closest thing we have in my box today. Did somebody tell you? <laughs> Good job. A little help. A little help. <laughs> okay, well, let's Thank see what we you. can do now that we have selected our particular right. fly. What do we do then? All Maybe right. we should spread out. That would be a good start, you think? I'm going to give you just a, a quick crash course okay. in fly casting physics. And uh, Physics shouldn't scare me, right? No. It's, okay. It's very simple. It okay. doesn't have to be difficult. But what we're going to do in front of us, initially, what we want to do over our head when we're fly casting, but... We want to start by just uh, taking our rod from left to right, stopping, letting the line straighten out, and then do it to the other side so that we can see what our line's going to do when it's over our head. And if you can get your line to straighten out, we've got a little <laughs> bit of a, a little bit of a mess going. Good to, good to do it in sync here, yes, wouldn't it? <laughs> that's right. That's right. But we're so you've the got idea. the basic concept uh -huh. anyway. And what we need to do is because the flies really don't have any weight to them when we cast. We need to have a rod or a system to deliver that fly. Okay. And the students are welcome to join us if they have a pencil at their desk and want to hold it in their hand and imitate our motions. Right. It's a good idea to try. Okay, let's We have the that. special fly line which has the weight that we need and it's made out of plastic uh -huh. and it will deliver the fly to the trout. The reason for all that casting when we have the fly in the air is to measure the distance of the fly to the fish. Okay, so you're so trying that to we target can, it. Yes, we want to be accurate. Okay, so, so what do we do now? Well, the next thing that we want to do is to show you what the fly rod is going to do oh. for you that you won't actually notice. It has a lot of energy that's delivered to the tip of the rod. Uh -huh. And so if What's I pull this made out of? graphite, graphite. Okay. this is a graphite fly rod. You can also use bamboo. There's uh, glass rods, all kinds of things. And I've been corrected on this. It is definitely a rod. A rod, not, <laughs> a, pole. not a pole. Not a fishing pole, okay. yes. So I can show you the type of energy that's, that's stored in the rod, and when I release it, 
Wow. It will deliver the fly line. And that's what it's doing in the air for me when I'm casting. And that keeps us from needing a whole lot of muscles to be going, doing the back and forth thing. We it's... don't need muscles at all. Okay. We need good timing and a little finesse. Okay. Well, I think that's my cue to leave. I don't think I have good timing or finesse. I'll leave you guys with Nancy. She's going to give you a little class. Elizabeth, let's go down to the stream. We'll Thanks, catch you later. Thanks, Joan. Okay. Thanks, Joan. Well, let's start with, um, I, have a, I have a question for you. And I think I'll ask Shubong. Um, what happens if your parent or someone is driving a car and you've got some momentum going and they suddenly slam on the brakes? Everything will fall forward. That's right. Everything is going to come forward. That's what we want to do with the fly line. While it looks like it's a very fluid motion, it's actually two parts to a cast. It's a back cast and stop and a front cast and stop. So we need to remember to stop and pause and give our line time to straighten out behind us. Okay. We also need to keep the line moving. Um, I have a question for Curtis. What happens if an airplane is flying through the air and it loses speed? It's going to fall out of the sky. So is our fly line. So we need to remember to keep it moving, but give it some nice timing and some nice, nice rhythm, and I'll let you all practice that. Really what a fly line allows us to do in a fly rod is to do the equivalent of taking a ping pong ball and throwing it about half the length of a football field because we have no weight. So it's just a matter of having good timing and, and good rhythm. And it's much like archery or darts where we want to um, not, not use the muscle that Joan mentioned, but we want to use finesse. So if you all keep practicing just even 10 minutes a day for about two weeks, you'll get good. Looks like Joan and Elizabeth are ready for me over on the stream. And uh, if you keep practicing, you'll get good enough so that you can even hit the cameraman. Provided, of course, you have a cameraman at home. You might want to try it, like, going for a rock or something like that. We're down at the stream now, and Elizabeth assures me that you can read books, you can read magazines, and you can also read a stream, although it's kind of a different process. It's a different right? type of reading, Joan. Okay. What are we doing here? Well, now, reading the water, it's just basically a problem-solving thing of how do I catch the fish. Okay. Now, when you come to the stream, you first want to remember that a trout is a wild animal, and you're, you're not, you need to sneak up on it. Okay. So I would probably come up a little bit further downstream, but I would come up to this little pool quietly, and it, this is a great piece of water because there's just so much going on. Is it good where there's a lot of water motion? There is a lot of food. When there's moving water, there's food coming down to the fish, and the okay. fish are facing upstream. Now, on either side of this running water, you can see a little bit of a current line or a seam. And the, okay. it takes a lot of energy to stay in the middle of the water. I mean, it, you get tired. So the fish isn't hanging out in the it's middle. It's not in the middle. Fish. It might dart out in the middle if it sees something nice to eat. But basically, it would probably be over here in the soft water. Okay. Now, on either side of the little running water, there are two weed mats that I, I think it's watercress, but brown trout. the weeds come together right, and right. create a the mess. Right, right. The mat, yeah. And that's, that's structure. Now, brown trout like to hide under things. They're big fish, they're aggressive fish, and they're sneaky predators. So you have different kinds of trout, you have different kinds of personalities. Oh, yeah. For. Trout are very, very aggressive okay. and territorial uh, fish. Okay. But the brown trout might be under there. Now, also on this side, you can't, uh, there's a little bit of glare on the water today, but there is a back eddy. There's a current line coming down that will swirl back up to the weed mat. So if you put your fly on that outside seam, mm -hmm. it might come back around and get the trout on the second try if it doesn't take it on the first try. So you get a second chance. Okay, you know, why aren't we in this? Why aren't you in this? No, stream? Well, Jonah's had a fish today. Well, actually, the, the trout season in Minnesota ended about a week ago. And so the fish are now spawning, and we want to be respectful of the spawning. Okay. So it's a renewable resource. Okay. Well, you know what? You've got lots of good information, but somebody wants a little bit more. We have a question from Stephen. Stephen, what's your question? Welcome to Bell Live. Does the water have to be a certain depth to catch a trout? Does the water have to be a certain depth to catch a trout? Uh, no, actually trout live in lakes as well, but um, most of the trout streams that I've been, I'm wading and walking in the water, so I don't want to go any higher than my chest, right. you know, so you don't get knocked off your feet. And, right. so. and you don't really just have to fish in streams, and you don't have to just fish for trout when you Oh, no, you fishing. can fly fish for all species of fish with uh, heavier rods and, and saltwater rods, and. And in lakes, the, the line sometimes is different. The line will sink into the, the lake water rather than float on the top like it would on a stream. Okay, do I understand we have another question out there? 
Okay. Well, you know, we don't have a question right now, but do feel free to call in or fax in or email us because we'd love to hear from you. Um, we should mention, too, she has great expertise. She is the vice president of the Twin Cities Trout Unlimited chapter, and you got to tell us what that means. Yeah. Trout Unlimited is a national conservation organization that's dedicated to the preservation and restoration of cold water fisheries. Now, our local chapter has been very involved in restoring trout habitat or working with the legislature to uh, when development is going to encroach on an existing watershed to educate the landowners and to uh, just keep it nice for generations to come. And one more phrase, catch and release. Explain it and why is that important? Oh, catch and release is, is our battle cry. <laughs> uh, trout is much too pretty to catch more than once, so we, we want you to, to admire it, to enjoy the sport, but put it back for the next time. Okay, good advice. And you stick around because we're going to be talking about trout stream restoration. Did you know that when you pave over vegetation, it causes 15% more runoff into neighboring watersheds? We are back, and we are talking about trout stream, <laughs> trout stream restoration. I'll get it out. Um, and uh, basically, we're, we're restoring it from what? What's the problem? Well, stream bank erosion is it's really a natural process, Joan, but uh, Oftentimes, this process is sped up by development or building a bridge mm -hmm. or something. It changes, it changes the flow of the water mm -hmm. and it erodes the bank. Okay. So we try to go in and, and help nature along and unplug the stream or, or shore it up with ground structure. Is there anything that we can do? Oh yes, if you're a landowner, you're building near a stream, you might want to not cut your lawn so far down to the water to uh, maybe not think about paving so much out back, but plant prairie grass, okay. things that will catch water. A root system. Things like that really do have impact that you Big might impact. not be aware of. Yeah. Okay, great advice. Thank you both for joining us today. Appreciate it. You know what, on that same topic though, um, just a couple of weeks ago our cameras followed a man by the name of Jason Meckel. Uh, he's a habitat specialist as he was trying to stabilize a private stream bank that was just down the stream here. Hi, I'm Jason Meckel with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I'm the Stream Habitat Specialist for our Metro Trout Streams Protection Initiative. I'm sorry I can't be here with you live today because I'm in Colorado taking some additional training in stream restoration. We're out here today to work on this stream because we have a highly eroding stream bank which is contributing a lot of sediment into the stream. One of the reasons that this bank is eroding is because we have this very shallow root mass, root lawn growing next to the stream. And because of that, it doesn't offer much protection to flowing water. Compared to this vegetation behind me, which has very deep roots and does protect the stream bank during high water. What we're gonna do is use natural materials like rocks and logs and new vegetation to stabilize this eroding stream bank and at the same time enhance the trout habitat. Now the first step in a stream bank stabilization is a thorough field investigation to determine the causes of the problem. To do this, we measured the width and slope of the stream and discovered that the concrete base of the bridge was placed in the stream at a higher elevation than the natural stream bed. Because of this, you can see how the water comes off at a steeper angle or slope and has more power to erode the stream bank. And in fact, if you listen, you can clearly hear the higher gradient. Our second problem is the short grass lawn, which I just showed you. This doesn't provide much resistance when large amounts of water flow down through the channel. So our work began. The technique we are using is called a root wad native material revet. We began by digging up a willow tree that had fallen over in a thunderstorm. We'll be placing this tree trunk and the roots of this willow in the stream bank to protect the bank during runoff from snowmelt and rainstorms. But first, with this excavator, we dug out a trench almost the exact size of the holes we'll bury the willow in. Then the tree trunk was lowered into place. And with my direction, the willow trunk was lifted up and driven down even further into the stream bank. Next, the root wad was carefully placed on top of the trunk. Notice that the roots are directed upstream. By doing this, we greatly increase the surface area along the stream bank. This additional surface area increases friction and creates a stronger resisting force on the edge of the stream. Now we're ready to place the boulders on top of the log. These boulders will help hold this root wad in place. 
Next, we placed the willow branches on the stream bank to encourage tree growth. Willows establish roots quickly when placed in this moist soil and grow very rapidly in the stream environment. One of the final steps in our stream restoration is to spread soil back over the branches and then smooth the surface. Now that we have all of our root wads and our rocks in place, we're ready for the finishing touches of this project, which is spreading out some native seed and rolling out some erosion blanket here to protect the soil during a storm uh, or snow melt. The final stage in that process is placing these willow stakes down in the soil here. These willows will grow into some large green shrubs which ultimately are going to provide shade and cover for the trout stream. And by the end of next summer, you won't even be able to hardly tell that we were in here doing the work that we did today. And we are back with our whole Bell Live team and we have just a couple of minutes to answer a couple more questions. I know Rebecca has one. Yeah, I was wondering if when we walk on the bottom of the stream, if that hurts the organisms that live there. Ooh, Dean, what do you think? Does that hurt the organisms that <laughs> live there? Well, Rebecca, what it will do is it obviously will dislodge them from the, from the rocks. They'll get into the water current tumble and probably the majority of them will will fall right back down and, and okay. once they're on the surface of, of a rock down there they'll reattach. Um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of times the insects will voluntarily do that. They'll, they'll, they'll release their hold on the rock, they'll drift in the water current, up comes a trout. So you might be doing the same thing. Sometimes <laughs> trout fishermen will love to be about 50 feet below cattle walking across the stream. That's dislodging uh, oh, organisms yeah. and the trout start feeding and uh, yeah, a little disturbance bad for the bugs, good for the trout. Uh, you're all part question. of the process. There you go. I got a question from Nathan in Malacca, Minnesota. How big of a fish can be caught on a fly line? Oh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, you can catch any species of fish on a, on a fly line. I personally, the biggest fish I have caught was a tarpon in Florida about two years ago, which is about 140 pounds and oh, six feet long. Taller and bigger than I was. Oh my goodness. That is one big fish. That was a big fish story. <laughs> okay, one more. I think this one's for you, Nancy. What is your favorite fish to fish for? That's a tough, that's a tough call. I enjoy all species. Uh, much like Elizabeth, I've done tarpon fishing and saltwater fishing in the ocean. Uh, my personal favorite for freshwater, I'd have to admit, would be salmon. Ooh. And uh, my personal best, uh, as far as a king salmon, was 38 pounds in Michigan. Oh my goodness. So, I also <laughs> enjoy <laughs> trout. Yeah. Actually, when you enjoy fly fishing, uh, that you can catch any species, and I like them all. And have a good time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Anybody else have a question? Everybody completely you guys satisfied. Have been great. Everybody's that happy. Be okay. Thank you for all of your efforts today. We appreciate it. And you back there, we appreciate all your questions. And We've had a great time. We really have. And don't forget, Bell Live 1999 on the prairie. We'll be observing bird behavior, test, uh, taste testing edible flowers. Won't that be fun? It'll be fun. But right now, we got to release those trout back into the stream. Yes. So you guys have a great day. Hey, it's been fun. Bye. <laughs> what job? High five. What did you say? All right. the Bell Life team and will be 13 or 14 years old next school year, you can apply to join us on the Prairie next October. Check our website for details. Fortunately, they're all gone. Yep, that's good.
Oh.